Hello and welcome to Insight, a program discussing matters of national importance to Guyana. And of course, on this program, we have a special group of panelists who will be joining us to discuss the issue of democracy and elections in Guyana. Of course, we know the aftermath of the March 2nd elections left Guyana holding its breath for over five months as parties battled it out in the courts all the way to the CCJ and back. And of course, that resulted in the final declaration by GCOM and the swearing in of President Dr. Irfan Ali, who is Guyana's executive president. Joining me on the program today, I have Mr. Sesnarain Singh, who is a financial consultant and he's also a member of the rapid assessment team overlooking operations of state agencies during this transition. Thank you so much, Mr. Narain, for joining us on Insight. Thank you very much. Also joining us virtually, we have jo Joss Kanai, Daniel Josh Kanai, who's a founding member of the New Movement Party, as well as Captain Jerry Gavaya, who's an advisor to President Ali on national security. And I'm your host, Andrea Bryan Garner. Now, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time out to be part of this special discussion program. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk to uh, Josh Kanai, who I know was part of the whole chaos that happened at the Ashman's building at the Tabulation Center. I know at one point you were even arrested. Talk about your uh, experience over this whole elections period and you know the process so far and where we are now, because I know you're also part of the team that brought charges against Mr. Lowenfield. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, panelists. Well, as you know, this five months that have gone by has been quite a, quite a play, quite a, a movie, per some say, right? And it's something that we will forever remember, at least my generation and myself. And it's been showing me a lot. I've gained a lot of experience. I've gained a lot of footprint in the political arena. And this experience is one where uh, it was unfortunate that it happened, but we have come a far away as a nation. It showed me that the nation has matured and that the nation has come to a level head whereby they can justify if one person is right and one person is wrong. And that's what we saw happen. We did not see any protests, which I'm very grateful and thankful for. Well, riots, I should say, not protests. And at the end of the day, uh, I experienced a lot about the inner workings of GCOM. Right? So overall, this experience had its pros and its cons. And as a youth moving into the future, I'm, I'm very thankful for the information gain. And over that period of time, we saw all of the inner loops that you can jump through. And we saw the inner workings whereby persons can or could have looked us and looked at us in our face and just told us no. At one point in time, I remember that Ashman's building, we had to be begging Mr. Lowenfield to give us information, to give us that flash drive for us to plug it into that laptop. We had to be begging him. And everyone was there begging for our rights to be looked upon. And he kept, kept on saying no. And that was that point where we had to see the numbers. We took pictures of that kid, flash drive kid, as he's known. And um, we saw everything that took place. And after that, that's how we, that's how we are grateful now for social media and the era which we live in. Because without all of this, at this point, I felt like without social media, we wouldn't have had that chance to have our rights be told that's how that's how these people made us feel well that entire building feel especially me so we had to fight and these are some of the, the red the red flags we saw and we knew we had to put up a great fight against this because how they were approaching this thing was really blatant it's a spit in our faces telling us that we're stupid it's an insult it was an insult to everyone's intelligence so Coming on to that now, we would have ended up at the CCG, as you know, and back up to the appeal court. In between that, we had the recount going on, which was another laughable situation within this entire process. So 
at the Recon Center, we would have seen much antics being carried on by the APNUAFC, where they would have had dead people voting and some were even uh, migrant voting, and then they'd call out an entire, entire list. They would call out 100 plus names sometimes. And then only one or zero would show up to have been a fault, right? So it was ludicrous at those point in times. And then the, the media was, they were slaughtering people outside in their little tent. And we saw a uh, few like Mai Paul and Norton and Valda and all of them. They, they, they exposed who their, their true character were. And <laughs> I can't say nothing, but, uh, but it was plain nonsense coming from that camp. And we got to the recount and we finished it. It was it was a, a point of rejoicing. It was another point which we had to fight and work very hard towards. And trust me, we did that. So now after the recount, we went to court again sometime for numbers which were so fraudulent, numbers which the, the recount had proven to be as fraudulent as possible. They still carried on and on and on, giving us another three months into that entire five months period so right now i feel someone has got to pay for it and mr lowenfield and gang ought to find out and ought to know by now that the persons who are taking you to court and the persons who are giving statement currently you have insulted them you have taken advantage of them and now you will have to suffer the consequences so at this point, the PPP is investigating Mr. Lowenfield, Mr. Mingo, Ms. Valda, uh, the well-known flash drive kid. And um, <laughs> we're, seeing, we're seeing progress, we're getting somewhere. Because as a youth, I do not want any part of this entire fiasco to ever repeat itself. I don't want them to even get close to where they would have gotten today. Right? And that, that goes ahead for all the other political parties as well. Democracy is the rights of the people. And we are people. So we have to respect that. And I feel what we're doing here is we have, it's keeping our memory fresh of what occurred so that our generations and our grandchildren will see and we will move forward in that fashion. It's not driving fear into the people, it's driving a sense of responsibility sense of maturity and a sense of zero tolerance for mediocrity that's okay. what we want to do mm -hmm. um at this point i know that the matters before the courts and so on what is the current status of that uh charge that was brought against mr lowenfield and others and what do you hope to be the outcome of the the matter Yeah, the charge brought against him was, uh, by myself was conspiracy to commit fraud. And currently that has, that has been investigated. That has been taken over by the DPP as well. And at this point, um, I have submitted my statements against Mr. Lowenfield. So the, uh, the crime chief and the lead investigator, they're going to be the ones who are going to spearhead this entire investigations have those documents that we need to prove that he committed fraud, have them in our uh, safekeeping, not our safekeeping, but the police and the DPP safekeeping. And for me, I am, I am, uh, I am glad it went this way. And uh, Mr. Nigel Hughes would have moved in a very rash uh, manner, without strategy, without thinking. And we, we're here and we're move, making much more progress than we anticipated, all right? So at this point, just wait. Okay, Mr. Gavaya, Captain Gavaya, I'd like you to come in at this point as well, because I know you've been there um, seeing the entire process from the beginning, even from the no confidence motion, because this is not necessarily a five month period process, but started quite a long time ago. Um, what has been your experience throughout this ordeal? And where do we go from here in terms of moving forward as a nation? You know, I listened to Josh. And um, Josh said it so well. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how they made us feel. 
We may forget what they said, we may forget what they did, but we will never forget how they made us feel. And they made us feel stupid. They were disrespectful. They had they they really believe they really were messing with the intelligence of the people in this country and the people in that room. And Joshua said it very, very well. And I would also like to say that those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And you know, there was a lot of people who felt that maybe we needed to give the PNC another chance, even after all of the um, the frightening things that happened in the year, in the 28 years of the rule of the PNC. But when the 2011 came around and 2015 came around, there was a feeling, let's give them a chance. But if we had lived by by the foundation of what those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. But I'll tell you what, we saw it being repeated. We saw it being repeated. And I'll tell you now, we must never forget, we must never forget what happened here in the last, from 2018, with the disrespect of our constitution, with the dis disrespect for the rule of law. The day that no confidence motion was passed, I was sitting in parliament. I was there as an observer from the private sector commission and I saw it happen. And I saw, at the end of that, I saw the leaders got up and they said, you know, um, they'll respect it. And, they, and I was actually quite, quite happy for the democracy of Guyana. The fact that um, the, 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 the vote went the way it, it, it did, um, you know, it, it happened and people were respecting it and the country is going to be respected. But then I saw the shenanigans. I saw the lies and the scampishness and my life as a pilot, mathematics, I live with mathematics every day. Mathematics, for, for CIS, as a chart of the content, mathematics keep him rich. For me, mathematics keep me alive. If we do wrong mathematics, we'll fly into a mountain. And so when people start to mess with my intelligence and tell me that, that, that 33 is not the majority of 65, and you start to do all of these crazy jiggery poogery it was so disrespectful. And the way they made me feel, the way they made me feel would live with me forever and ever and ever. And the law abiding citizens of Guyana will never forget. We will never forget the way they made us feel. And I want to tell people, um, if we forget it, we condemn to repeat it. And so we have to be, this move, this entire episode, starting from 2018, move from politics to ethics. You know, it's all well and good for us to have a division of power. Everybody's entitled to their political choice, to their political party they want to. And I have no quarrel with anybody that is a supporter of any political party because I am certainly not a member of any political party. I say it publicly here today. Um, but I've lived through, as an army officer, I lived through the years of the PNC. I lived through Mr. Height. I lived through the years of the PPP. I lived through the last five years. And um, it is people's right to have different political choices, but it's not your right. The minute you cross the line and you cross the line of ethics into dishonesty, lack of integrity, lack of decency, um, and I, then, then you have crossed the line for me. And, um, and that is no longer politics, that is now criminality. And I think Josh again said it, the people who cross the line the people who attempted to steal our democracy and steal our rule and, and disrespect the rule of law and Guyana and disrespect the constitution. Remember, the only thing that protects the citizens of any country from government and politicians is the constitution, is the rule of law that corrals them. It, it certainly did um, in the last, in the last uh, government and must do it again in this government. So that no government, no politicians must be allowed to, to become reckless and irresponsible. The rule of law and the constitution must corral them. And what we saw was a vague, flagrant disregard, disregard for the rule of law, disobedience to the constitution. Um, in terms of what happened in the, in the Ashman buildings, I want to tell you that, you know, in 2011, in 2011, as a chairman, in, well, I was not the chairman of the Private Commission, I was the head of the governance and security. And when those elections were over. The MC was actually protesting, might have been the APNU, they were protesting on the streets at the time because they, they wanted GCOM to give them their SOPs. And when I went to Dr. Suarez, but I said, why aren't you giving them Dr. Suarez? But I said, why should I give them? They have the exact same copy of the SOP that we have in GCOM. 
and the private sector commission led a delegation to Dr. Serge Bali and asked him to please give it to them. And Dr. Serge Bali agreed and he, and he had all of the SOPs from GCOM scanned on a CD and it was distributed far and wide to everybody. But I remember thinking back in 2011, why is it that these people needed these SOPs? When in fact, the SOP they have is the exact carbon copy of the SOP that GCOM got. And I keep wondering why is it that they needed these SOPs? Um, because in all of the elections before, people dealt with the ballot box and the, and the actual ballot and the vote when they were trying to rig the elections. I could not understand how the SOP will come into a tampering of the elections. Well, because of course, it was supposed to be happening in front of everybody. And then in 20, 2015, we saw it again. In 2015, um, we saw this, this, um, this issue with, 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 with the SOP starting to be raised and, and the PVP were, were talking about the fact that the SOP was, was tampered with and none of us really believed them. So I started to think about this thing at the Private Sector Commission and we put together a think tank at the Private Sector Commission and read the law. And the law says that the election result must be declared at the, at the regional officer's level after he would have sat around a table with all of the, of the party agents and they would have um, done the, the tabulation of the SOPs, SOP by SOP in front of everybody agreeing to that. And I remember talking to GCOM, talking to Lowy Field, when Patterson became the, the chairman, we, private sector, would meet with them and we keep on emphasizing this point because before this, GCOM never allowed the, the returning officers to, to make the declaration. In fact, those returning officers were sitting in a room by themselves and tabulating that, those, those SOPs. But in, 20, in 2020, by, 20, by the time 2020 came, came about, we all were anticipating this. And so the private sector was very clear that the tabulation of the, of the SOPs at the returning officer level um, had to be one that was exceptionally transparent. And so every time at the private sector commission level, we met with all the small, the small parties, we met with all the observers, we continuously talk about this issue. And I don't know, I can't believe that the people who, the architects and the brains behind the people who pulled the strings to put Mingo up to what he did, believe that they were operating back in 1970 and 1980, that this was 2020 and that there's no way you will get away with something. So it was such a juvenile attempt. It was so juvenile, it was so barefaced, it was so disrespectful for what Mingo was attempting to do at GCOM. And Josh, I wanna tell you, I feel for you. I was there myself and I am a soldier. I went and I said it in my Facebook yesterday, I went to the top of Mount Corrino, place hardships. I went to the bottom of Kaitro Falls. As an army officer, I did all the hard things nothing makes me bring tears to my eye but i remember the day i was standing in gcom i was standing in gcom and when i saw what mingo started to do tears came to my eyes and at that moment i said over my dead body we will never ever allow these people to steal our democracy give me but democracy or give me that i like and to i want in. to say we got democracy this is where I'd like to bring in Mr. Sais Narayan Singh, uh, because of course you would have been present at the tabulation center as well, and you're part of the investigations um, regarding the charges against Mingo. Well, if we could bring in your perspective and tell us at what point are we at this point um, in terms of the investigation and the role that you had to play. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me into your studios and, and Guyana, thank you for inviting me into your, your living rooms. Um, the principle is one man, one vote. That's the principle. Um, and whoever wins because of that principle wins. It doesn't matter to me. But what I saw over those five months um, was shocking. It was like a movie. Even on to now, sometimes you don't even believe you went through this. Um, but what I want to say clearly, and I've seen this yesterday, when I was at CID headquarters, giving my statement, I saw Mr. Mingo there. And I saw a man who moved from immense power and abuse to a man who was trying his best now to save himself from jail. 
Guyana will not and never ever tolerate this lack of integrity and disrespect for the will of the people ever again. Because, you know, every country right now, the United States has a, um, an electoral campaign. Lots of words will be say, said, lots of promises will be made. But never have I ever seen a country that moved from such a national political campaign to public dishonesty. It was absolute dishonesty and disrespect for the people. You know, um, a Barbadian professor, I think, co coined the term, and I want a copy from him. This was sanctimonious gangsterism. It was a bunch of gangsters who decided they wanted to hijack a nation and they were going to use agents within GCOM, which I saw with my own eye. And I want to dis distinguish. There's a, this is a four-step process. I'm starting to sound like Granger. Um, <laughs> step one was Ashman 1, which was in the front of Ashman's building. Then there was Ashman 2, which was at the back of the building. Then there was GCOM headquarters, which around the, um, the 13th of uh, March. Then there was, of course, the recount. Um, where it really went rogue, I mean, there was elements of roguism in Ashman 1, which was at the front of the building. But where it really went rogue was in Ashmin's 2. And that point was chosen because, as I said in my statement, Ms. Roxanne Myers made the decision, according to um, one of the officers called Colin April, he said to us at the barrier that only one person per entity will be allowed in the building. Mm -hmm. And he said he's following the instructions of Ms. Roxanne Myers. The design of that strategy, and this tells you how these people were conniving to steal an election, was to only have about 17 people in the room so they can bamboozle them. Um, I could remember Josh was in the room. This is Ashman too. This is where there were 17 people. Next to me was uh, Jonathan Yearwood and, and, and so forth. There were lots of people. The US ambassador was there, um, the British High Commissioner, Canadian. Hi, Commissioner. I, I think Jerry was there also. But those 17 people, those were the, the real witness of the fraud. It was real fraud. Um, and I couldn't believe my eyes what I was seeing because I saw Mr. Mingo move from a Jekyll to a Hyde. Anybody who knows Mr. Mingo, he's a quiet, soft-spoken, pastoral kind of fellow. Um, but I saw with my own eyes a man who actually become, became almost wolf-like with anger, hitting the desk loudly, saying, I shall not listen to you. I shall do it my way. And my way is to go with this spreadsheet. And he instructed his staff to proceed, knowing very well when, because we were exposing and objecting to all these inflated numbers from the APNU, and, and stealing a couple of votes from the PPP. Now, you are a, what you call a, a statutory officer. You uphold our constitution. You uphold the laws of Guyana. Section 84 of the Representation of the People Act clearly says what you do in a tabulation room. Mm -hmm. It's only one way. One way is comparing apples with apples. Statement of polls, the original statement of polls in the possession of GCOM with the carbon copy of those originals that was presented to the stakeholders in the polling station, they're supposed to be the same document, only a carbon copy separates the two. And you were supposed to be comparing those numbers and then adding them up. Mm -hmm. And that was what was not happening. This is something I'd like to throw out to the entire panel because I know in reports um, that I've read, both Lo and Phil and Mingo would have said that they have acted within the law. Um, does that mean that we have to look at uh, constitutional reform and reform of our laws? Or is it that they misinterpret the wide scope of their own powers um, given their positions as officers of GCOM? Um, <laughs> I'll tell you something. This 2020 election day, the day, March 2nd, 2020, was one of the best elections day I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. The system works. What did not work was that some people decided that they were going to hijack the law and invent and make rules as they went along. 
Um, there's nowhere in the law that says a spreadsheet exists. There's no need, no use, no purpose of a spreadsheet. It is statement of polls to statement of polls. That is the law. It works. The law can work. The problem is, for me, I believe the only problem GCOM has is they have a dysfunctional board. I don't like that idea of three from one side and three from the other side and a, and a, and a, and a chairman who is all political appointees. I believe, and I want to make this call, it is time that we have that constitutional reform to make sure the GCOM board has independent stakeholders. We need a private sector representative who is not politically affiliated on the GCOM board. We need somebody from the Bar Association. We need other stakeholders on the GCOM board. But other than that, GCOM's machinery works. And it was proven in the recount process because what those 2,399 presiding officers did, generally we found that it was correct in the recount process. Mm -hmm. So those 2,300 people with their, their staff of two or three in the polling station, they did their job mm -hmm. and they need to be celebrated as heroes. The real rogues in the system was a handful of people in the secretariat of GCOM and the, pre the office of the presiding officer of Region 4 who decided they will step outside of the law and do their own things. Let me bring in um, Captain Govaya as well as Mr. Kanai as a private sector representative as well as a representative from the new parties to chime in on what um, Mr. Singh mentioned about the composition of the GCOM board as a new party, as a private sector representative. Um, how do you feel about the composition with just having representatives from the two uh, major parties, or, so to speak? And what would you like to see in ahead, terms Josh. of restructuring that in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Well, for me, um, Sis did bring a very valid point at the end there with having a much more inclusive board, a board that uh, that fully represents the population of Guyana, as per se. I agree with that completely. You see, um, the election process, it's a good one. It's, it's one where, at the beginning stages, that is, where you go and cast your vote, that's very, that's robust, right? That's a robust system. The problem for me is in the Constitution where it comes down to the tabulation and the entire uh, powers of the GCOM Secretariat after you would have collected votes, etc. That's where my problem lies, and that's where I feel that our Constitution needs to have some more check and balance, as we call it in the corporate world, check and balance system whereby. Mr. Mingo would not have had the authority to do what he's doing at this point in time. All right? Mr. Mingo should have been cut off at the very instant he was seen to be behaving in a malicious way. But that did not happen until after. So now you see, this is where Say's point as well comes in with the board being more inclusive. All right? Because it's three, three, and then one, Madam Chair. So that's not enough check and balances per se, and that goes along the entire workforce. Some sort of check and balance, whether it be the board system being changed or via the constitution, constitutional reform, or it being it's being going to be changed from the level of the secretariat coming down. All right. So at the end of the day, we need constitutional reform, the essence of it, and I am totally for us being representatives on this commissioning commission board for GCOM. The, 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 at this point, <laughs> I want to um, say uh, APNU doesn't even deserve to be on that board. I'm sorry, I have to say it bluntly. They don't deserve maybe one of their representatives or two, since uh, Desmond Trotman was part of the WPA. Maybe he can be removed and insert one of the, the rest of persons from the political parties in that slot. Right? So I am for constitutional reform around the entire election, tabulation, verification, and those who hold powers to be reformed. Um, okay. Thank and you, John. Um, yeah. Sorry, I was going to make the point that um, I actually believe that while there's, 
there's some reform that could happen. Um, generally, I agree with CIS, the systems and Josh, the systems are very robust. And what you had here was um, a, a conspiracy to, um, to steal the elections and to bypass the law. And certainly now that Mingo is facing the, the, the court, um, the court will tell us exactly where those, um, those violations happen. But I believe if there, I have no difficulty with a little bit reform at the level of the, uh, the commission. But I think in a big way, uh, says if you, be, if you could understand what happened at the convention center and the recount in that tabulation room, if we could have our national election tabulation done at that level of scrutiny and exactness, it takes away, it takes away the opportunity for any one single person attempting to interfere with the system. So what we saw at the convention center during the recount was world class when it comes to accountability and safeguards of the system. Even in the counting stations, when we were opening the ballot box and counting the ballots, the way the ballots were put on the screen and the people in the room, I think the, what happened at the convention center is a good example of what we need to do at the national level when we come back to elections in the future so that in every in every returning officer tabulation center they should have a duplicate of what happened at the at the convention center notwithstanding at the polling station i think we need to we need to add two additional things to that polling station one i would like to see a purse a, a, a prominent cc ccp camera um, at the entrance of the polling station so every single person that entered that polling station a photograph will be taken of them uh, not voting but certainly at the entrance and second of all when you go there, you put your finger on a fingerprinting machine and and it pulls up your bio data out of the out of the database so that it also registered the time that you were at the polling station. I think those two things, when it comes to accountability, would take us a far, far away. I believe the laws are good. I think what happened here is that people violated the law vagrantly. And for them to say that they didn't violate the law is an insult to our intelligence. But those three things, I believe, well, before we wrap up, I just want us to talk about, since we're talking about um, elections and our next elections, I know that there is a plan to have an elections petition filed, and there was a press conference by the AFC and a statement put out by APNU, I believe, um, where they spoke about the need to um, relook at the declarations, as well as perhaps um, asking for a remedy of, an, of fresh elections. What are your thoughts on that moving forward? And would it mean that Guyana would now go back into a series of um, court cases? And you know, Guyana as a whole, I guess, has been uh, stressed to the point of having to go through a long process, probably the longest electoral process in Guyana's history. Um, what are your thoughts on the, the statements and the press conference and the pending elections petition? Yes, we could start with you, Mr. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, the, one of the things that we really need to understand is um, let's have the petition because with the petition comes the statement of polls from GCOM. So this nation will then finally see what um, in 2015, I think, uh, the APNU got to see. Um, as an opposition party, and I think before that the private sector commission had also asked, and they got to see. So this nation will finally get to see those statement of polls, and we and this will bring to bear and it will lay bare what Mr. Mingo has done. And I want to say, yesterday I was asked by the criminal investigation department to file a statement of my observations of what I saw over those months that we spent with Mingo and Lewin Field and Myers um, and the small cabal that work with them um, in perpetuating a delay in the announcement of the results. Um, and I was very, very proud and happy. I've never been to Ivleri. This is the funny <laughs> thing. So when I be went to Ivleri, um, I was so proud um, of going into this building because I was saying to myself, I'm going to be a soldier now to, to put an end to this never again in our history as a country should we ever allow spenders of the taxpayer money 
to abuse the taxpayers like this, like how they have abused the taxpayers. And, and um, I, I want to say one couple of things that I observed when I was there. One, the police was very professional with us. And um, they did a process called, they call it confrontation, but it wasn't really a confrontation. They allowed me to read my statement to Mr. Mingo. I got to look him in the eye and read my statement, well, read from my mind what I felt that I saw. And I saw a man who, I think he regretted his action. He regretted his action, but he, he's well lawyered up because his response was no comment. Um, but I know that he regretted his, uh, uh, his actions because he just didn't hold me back for five months. He held a nation back for five months and that's on him. And he will have to carry that burden for the rest of his life. Captain Gavaya, Dr. Kana, your thoughts on the elections petition, the pending elections petition? Yeah, thank you very much. I want to, even as we speak now, even as we speak now, there are people on the road on, on, the, East, on, the, East Bank, on the East Coast Road protesting on the street, talking about um, um, justice for, uh, what's the name of, the, of, the, of the, um, the young boy? Is it February? Is it? Um, Live on. They're talking about justice in Mingo and justice. For, and I, these people have been, they're being lied to by their leaders. They're talking about injustice and racial discrimination. Um, and the same lies that, that will go into the election petition, they're, they're feeding those lies to their supporters. And as we speak now, in the rains that are, that, are, that are covering Guyana today, those people are in the rain protesting based on lies told to them by their supporters. I will say to you, like says, I anxiously await to see this petition that will come out um, that will I, I think once and for all, once and for all, this is not about lying to the world because the world don't believe them. They could write anybody in the world. Nobody will believe them, but their supporters are believing them. And I believe once and for all, the courts of Guyana and the Caribbean Court of Justice, if they ever take it there, will insult them because they are being exceptionally dishonest. And to say that dead people vote and immigrant and migrants vote, um, and the issue with the boxes without the, without the documents inside. Well, I saw the documents in the GCOM office. We have video of the documents in the GCOM office, the 48 boxes that they say they found without documents. Those, those documents, we saw it in the GCOM office and there's video evidence showing those documents in envelopes, hundreds of them, um, and, and because there were like two or three envelopes of ballot box and they were all there in the GCOM office. And so, when the time come to deal with this matter of the election petition, they're going to be very, very embarrassed. How do they explain that 2,339 of their supporters were sitting in the polling station? And every polling station, you had five GCOM staff. In every polling station, you have a PPP member and other small parties from Josh Party and so on. How in the name of heaven are you going to convince a court that a dead man walk in there and vote? I walk in Sam Jerry Gavai when every agent have a folio with my picture on it. How are they going to convince? Uh, they, I mean, they certainly can't con convince intelligent people. They are going. They are trying. They are. They are really, really lying to their supporters, and they are misleading them, and they have them in the streets now. And let me just say this: after these elections, I see people start to invoke race. Uh, they're saying that, oh, we say Mingo was a uh, method fraud because he's a black man, which is nonsense, it had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with, with ethics. The Mingo is now in police custody, got nothing. It got to do with the fact that he attempted to, to commit fraud, or he did commit the fraud in Guyana. And it is, it is a time when you look at the APNU uh, campaign, they said they were a big tent. And then under that big tent, they have Indian people, Portuguese people, Amerindian people, black people of Guyana. And in the PPP was exactly the same thing. This was not an election about race. This was an election about issues which they lost. And then a lot of their dishonest leaders started to try to make it into a racial issue that somehow all of these allegations, when you see they will call the, the US ambassador a, a KKK and they, that they're racial, 
that because they're taking these positions against what they were doing, I think we have hit rock bottom. They have hit rock bottom. And even as we speak now, their people, they have lied to their people and those same lies, they're going to try to take it into court and the court will embarrass them. Perhaps you'd like to weigh in on the petition? Uh, yes, well, indeed, uh, thank you, Cap. These two gentlemen have stated it all. Right? And I want to leave um, a little joke. Uh, I've been wondering how this petition will play out, and I see that it will definitely bring the APNU to their feet, to their faces, sorry. And the joke is basically, um, so they're claiming the dead people vote. And now I'm thinking to myself one day, if these dead people did vote, I guess they did vote for everybody else except them. They voted TNM, they voted Anog, and that's, that's nonsense, right? <laughs> and that's what it's going to uncover, that these people are, are plain out right mediocre and full of nonsense full of laughs full of full of uh, i don't even i don't even want to say the word because it's gonna it's gonna sound too disrespectful to them but they're they're outright stupid just sticking a point and I'm sorry, because, it, yeah w w sorry um a former lieutenant colonel of the army called george gomes during this entire time had made a point where he said and he made this point on may 30th he said over 8,000 disciplined service member votes were not stamped in PPP stronghold. And I'm quoting from a newspaper here, the Stafford News. Now, I did an investigation of all those areas where uh, there was intermixing with disciplined service votes into civilian votes. And what I found, there was 249 boxes where this happened. And there were only 52 votes, only 52 ballots were invalidated for want of official marks. And this is the kind of variances of, of the allegations being made. So here you had a PNC, a, a parachik was saying, oh, over 8,000 disciplined service people have been invalidated because, um, you know, the PPP tried to steal the elections. And when the evidence were unearthed, only 52 ballots were invalidated. Now, the question is, we don't know if those 52 ballots were civilians or, or disciplined service. Mm -hmm. So it could have been 52 civilians. Mm -hmm. And this is, the, this is the reality of what we've been able to peel away. Now, as I said, I don't care who wins. Once the principle of one man, one vote is respected, that is what matters. And I'm appealing to people who are, and I'm giving you an example here again. So we saw yesterday in the AF AFC, um, virtual press conference, one of their leaders call it saying that, um, oh, we are not going to go to the convention center because we don't want to get COVID. We want to do it virtually so we can protect ourselves. But yet this same group of people is calling on the ordinary man and woman to go into the streets on Monday to protest, among others, exposed to COVID um, so that they can protest for, for this filing of this petition. It is, it, is, it is hypocrisy. And this is the problem I have with this group of people. I have a major problem when a political leader said to you, oh, I don't want to be exposed to COVID, but you can go because you're from Boston. I don't care if you die or live. That's the kind of mentality they, they carry on with. They treat the, the, the poor and the working class with one standard and they treat themselves and their friends and their inner cabal with a different standard. And that is what I'm appealing to Guyanese people, to not follow people, politicians blindly. And it goes on all sides. Think, ask questions, then take action. Don't just blindly follow them. Because all of those politicians, especially the ones in the, who just came out from the AP and UAFC government, they're multimillionaires. Some of them are billionaires. And they haven't shared a cent of that money with you in the, in the villages. Well, on that point, Mr. Narayan, Mr. Singh, <laughs> Mr. Narayan Singh, I'd like to say thank you so much for being on the program, as well as our panelists, uh, Dr. Josh Kanai and Captain Jerry Govaya. Uh, thank you for sharing your insight on insight as we spoke about matters of importance to Guyana. And I hope that we'll continue this discussion at some other point as the things progress in terms of Guyana, our elections, and our democracy. I'm Andrea Bryan Garner saying thank you so much for watching, and do continue to wear your mask and stand
sanitize and protect yourself. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.